Well, do you think there is a more popular, more long-lasting image for children in this country than Noah and the Ark? We write cute little songs about Noah. Children play with little toy arcs, putting the animals in and taking them out for hours at a time. And nurseries and Sunday school rooms across our country have big, bright, cheery arcs with pairs of animals all around painted on the walls. Right in the next building. So how did this story about tragedy and destruction and anger turn into such a cheery little tale for children? The full story, the grown-up story of Noah and his family is not so cute and tidy. Now one often has to edit the reading of the stories that we know and love because they're so long. So it's not surprising that the portion of the story read today has been edited down to fit within the theme of the series that we're following. This is a series that recalls the trials and tribulations of our spiritual ancestors. It's about how they withstood the hardships they encountered, and most importantly, it's about God's presence and action in their lives. On this day, when we focus on God's saving acts in our lives, it just makes sense that we focus on the saving acts piece of the flood story. But I think that the story remains a cute little story about happy animals in the ark if we don't at least take a look at the rest of the story. And so I want to read for you a piece of the text from Genesis 6 that leads up to today's reading. It says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. These are the descendants of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw that the earth was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. So first you may have noticed that there was this little break in the text, like a little hiccup that makes you wonder if you're starting a new story or sticking with the old one. That's just a little hint that the way we read the Bible now is not necessarily the original version of the story. It's a little hint that someone along the way has reinterpreted or added to it in order to make it fit the context of that time and place. But I'm not going to get into that conversation about editing and redacting in the Bible. That's for another day. But suffice it to say that we have in this story two different assumptions about why God would send a flood that wiped out the whole world and why only one family seems to have been saved from its wrath. The first story names only humanity as the cause of God's anger, but the second says all flesh had corrupted its ways, and that the earth was filled with violence because of it. 
Like many of you, I struggle mighty, mightily with the notion that God is sitting somewhere up in the clouds deciding on the best punishment for humanity. It's even tougher when the story suggests that the punishment is due all of creation. Because if we start to believe that tragedy and difficulty and oppression are God's punishment, then it is way too easy for us to put on our self-righteous, speaking for God judgment caps and try to root out what's wrong with people who are experiencing tragedy. On a smaller human scale, we see it. It sounds a lot like the people who are constantly trying to find something wrong with each black person who is shot by law enforcement. Because if we can find something wrong, then we don't have to face the reality that this is a complex situation. That working alongside the countless wonderful law enforcement officers, there are in fact poorly trained and white supremacist members on the police force. If we think about it on a larger global scale, sounds a lot like a lot of televangelists I've heard, who blame the destruction of hurricanes and fires and floods on anything they deemed to be sinful. Neither, none of that works for me. I just can't put that together with unconditional love. So what do we do with Noah? How do we continue to love this story when it has been so completely stripped of its complexity? Well, here's a question that popped into my head this morning as I was pondering this text. What if the flood itself was God's saving act? I mean, we always read the Bible stories through one particular lens, through the lens of humanity, and in particular, through the lens of that one human hero of the story. Through that lens, Noah was God's chosen, and he alone had access to the information about the coming of the flood. Noah was directed to build the ark and save a remnant of the other species to repopulate the earth. Noah's family alone was saved from total annihilation. Well, of course we read these texts through human lenses. They were written through human lenses. We are human. And being human, we are limited in our vision. And then when we get stressed, many of us turn in on ourselves and block out everything around us because we are so afraid if danger comes, we won't recognize it. But in addition to that limited vision, God has also given us a great imagination the ability to think beyond ourselves when we choose to do so. And so today, I ask you to wonder how this story looks from a world-centered lens rather than a human-centered lens. And I ask again, what if the flood itself was God's saving act? I think about the way our bodies shed cells on a regular basis, and sometimes we need to scrub a little bit to get those dead cells off of our body. I think about how bison rub against trees in the spring to shed their winter coats. What if the earth, the whole earth, just needs a good cleanse every once in a while? What if it has nothing to do with whether humans have made God angry or not? What if the real tragedy for us as humans 
is that we have so convinced ourselves that we are above creation, separate from creation, and that all creation revolves around us, that we just don't notice the patterns and signs that warn us that the world is ready for a good cleansing flood once again. Or a fire, or a hurricane, or a tornado, or could I even say, perhaps, a virus. I don't think we get to pick and choose who is being punished and whose faith is being tested. I don't think we get to pretend that we know the mind of God. And I don't think that God only saves heroes and holy people. And, dare I say, I don't think that humankind alone should be spared or is spared by God from experiencing tragedy and death. There is a presence in this universe, an energy, if you will, that is bigger than all of us. On our best days, we can sense that energy, we can sense that presence, and I choose to name that mystery God. There are patterns to life that in all of our scientific wisdom, we still cannot recognize. I choose to believe that those patterns are designed by the one that I call God. And so as I think about the story of Noah, and this great flood, and the repopulation of the earth, I think of the Creator. The one who set it all in motion. And I try to imagine beyond my limited human thinking. Imagine beyond God playing favorites and saving only one to punish the rest. I think about the opportunity for renewal and regeneration that often comes after flood or fire or volcanic eruption. I think how tragedy often brings us, as humans, back to the realization of what is truly important. How many interviews we've heard with someone who just lost every household possession, who says, but we have each other, and so we're going to be okay. That's faith. That's faith. This isn't the story of God saving one family and a whole load of animals. This is the story of God's saving acts throughout time and for all of the earth. It's about, it's the story of how easy it is for this world to lose its way and forget about our connection to everything that is sacred and holy. It's the story of God's faithfulness and the beautiful rainbow that reminds us that time and time again, regardless of what tragedy we experience, God will save. The earth will regenerate. We will regenerate. It's written into our DNA and into the very design of our universe. I will remember my covenant, says God. This story helps us to remember as well. May it always be so. Amen.